I know that wasn't for me. <laughs> Welcome to the Gerald R. Ford Museum. Uh, we are very happy to have each of you out here tonight. Uh, so it looks like a marvelous crowd. My name is Don Holloway. I'm the museum's curator, and we are here tonight to welcome to our stage a man who needs no introduction before this audience, I'm sure. Uh, you've watched Brian Kilmeade for years now on uh, Fox News, Fox and Friends, listened to him on the, uh, his radio show. Uh, some of you might even remember his sports coverage early in his career and his first book, The Games Do Count, for which I might add, he interviewed President Ford. Most of you probably have read his other books about uh, George Washington and his spy ring or Thomas Jefferson and his war against the Tripoli pirates. Now he's turned his attention to Andrew Jackson, the savior of New Orleans, and quite likely the savior of our young nation's continental ambitions, perhaps even the very republic itself. Some historians in pursuit of their subjects seek to frame that person within the epic uh, context of his or her times. For example, think of David McCullough and what he did with John Adams and Harry Truman. Brian chooses another path to find the moment that illustrates the man, and in so doing, to remind us why these very human figures are celebrated. Along the way, he introduces his readers to a fascinating cast of characters. In this book, um, to William Weatherford, a Creek Indian pursued by Jackson, who Brian's gifted storytelling reveals reflects many of Jackson's own qualities. Or to the British Admiral Alexander Cochran, who because of poor decisions considerably weakens the hand played by his counterpart, General Edward Pakenham, as he faces Jackson only miles from New Orleans. These characters and more Brian weaves into a tapestry that reveals this key struggle, even as it gives form to a man who by dint of his own Herculean effort saved the day and defines an age. So help me welcome to our stage, Brian Kilmeade. Great job, Dan, thank you. Don does a better job telling my story than me. I don't know if I can follow that. I mean, the way you looked into the way I researched the story, that was exactly my approach. And I guess my microphone is working. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. I truly appreciate it. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do, ever since I had a chance to interview President Ford, was we had a station in Grand Rapids, very proud of our radio show. Um, and when we got a station in Grand Rapids, I said, great. When I have my next book come out, I'd like to come out here. But Don didn't talk to me first because I didn't know him, and he was rebuilding the place, so it wasn't available. As soon as it became available, uh, they said yes, and I said yes, so we're here in the paperback. So um, uh, Don Holloway, thanks so much, appreciate it, and uh, for, thanks for reading the book. And uh, Joel Westfall, thanks for making this whole uh, night work, and everybody that put this together, and you most of all, for coming out. So I have a, a couple of different ways to go on speeches. I usually ask, well, you know, what do you guys want? And uh, I can go either way through history, through sports. I can combine them both. But I also thought when I got this, uh, my first idea for doing a book was my remarkable average athletic ability yielded very little in my life. Although I wanted to be great at sports and I wasn't, and I one of these guys that put the effort in and didn't get the results, a lot of people would say to me, wow, you're working really hard to be an average player on a Division II soccer team. <laughs> and yet you laugh. How dare you? <laughs> And I did. And when I was done, unremarkable, couldn't have tried harder at 22 years old, I said, that's not going to happen in my next career where I possibly have more talent, and that's being a broadcaster. And then at, the more I talked to people, the more I found out that most people aren't playing uh, in the NFL on Sundays or in the NBA on Thursdays. A lot of them try to be great or try to be good, and they have remarkable things that happen during their lives that shape them. So uh, I gave this pitch to a woman that worked with me called Judith Regan, who was at one point the number one publisher around, and she was hosting a show, and I said, I got this idea for a show. I told her what I just told you. She goes, yeah, all right, do it. I'm not going to pay you much, but you can do it. I go, I think I just got a book deal. I'm not sure. Is this the way it works? So I showed up, and I said, I want to get Gerald Ford. I want to get George Bush. I want to get Ronald Reagan, sadly, was suffering from 
uh, Alzheimer's, so we got his biographer. But I want to get people that didn't go pro and, and find out how it shaped them. So to get a call, I taped every conversation. So I didn't want to bring a cassette recorder here because most of you guys gave up your Walkmans a long time ago. <laughs> so I did want to read an excerpt from uh, the Gerald Ford I know that I wanted to focus on. And it's this guy. Hope this works. It's the football player. And he had probably the most insightful interview that I had. And he really opened up to me in a phone conversation, which started off kind of rough, because I think by mistake I hung up on him. I think I panicked. <laughs> he didn't really like that. So I thought I blew my interview with the President of the United States. So he talked about what sports did for him, let alone the contract you see up there that he could have went to the Packers. He was great, OK? Starting center in Michigan, you got to be great. He didn't think he was great. He didn't think he could go to the next level. But he talked about what football gave him. He said, my playing football and getting my name in the papers led me to my biological father finding me. He surprised me one day when I was working at a hamburger stand. My job was to slap burgers on the grill, handle the cash register, and wash dishes. One day at noon, I was behind the counter in my regular spot near the register when I noticed a man just staring at me by the candy display. He'd been there 15 or 20 minutes without saying a word, and he was staring at me. I'm Leslie King. I'm your father. Can I take you to lunch? I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. I stared at him and said, I'm working. He said, ask your boss if he can get off. My father took me outside to a brand new Lincoln. A woman was sitting beside him. He introduced me as his wife. They'd taken me on the train to Detroit, to Wyoming, where they lived. They took the train for Wyoming, uh, to Detroit, to Wyoming, where they lived, had purchased the car, and now they're driving home through Grand Rapids, right here. He asked me about sports and wanted to know all about my playing football at South High. We didn't mention the divorce or anything, any disagreement at lunch. After lunch, he drove me home, gave me 25 bucks. He said, now, boy, buy yourself something you would, that you would not be able to afford otherwise. That night was one of the most difficult of my life. I don't recall the exact words I used to tell my parents. But as you know, we didn't take their name. Sports brought that to him. So if you don't walk out with the Lombardi Trophy, maybe it does pay off. He went on to say, I think my dealings with the press had as much of an impact on my later life and the successes I had actually playing at Michigan Stadium as a football player. You have critics in the stands and critics in the press. Few of them ever centered a ball. He was a center, as you guys know. Few of them ever centered a ball, kicked a punt, or thrown a touchdown pass with 100,000 people looking at you. Yet they assure you they know more than you and have all the answers. <laughs> Their comments helped me develop a thick skin. And in later years, whenever critics assailed me, I just let their jibes roll off my back. What I did is I knocked out my questions, making them into essays. What he went on to say is, his senior year, the team collapsed. And he said, you don't know what it's like to be five and six and play at the University of Michigan. He said, we got booed by 100,000 people. So when people would get on me, or the press would be critical of me, or mock me, it just wouldn't matter. I've already been humiliated, and I'm fine. <laughs> Later, we get him to be an assistant boxing coach and get him into an Ivy League university. And we all know what he did in the military and became uh, uh, President of the United States. Again, an example of we seem to get the right person at the right time in the right place to run the country. Gerald Ford was an example of that. Another guy, everybody says is the best, and I don't argue, is George Washington, which brings me to why I'm here tonight. I was, I'm fascinated by history. Anybody? Just love it. I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm just saying that that's my fun. When I want to forget about the news, I read history, which means you don't want to hang out with me. I'm boring. <laughs> but a as we... As I go through, I should probably close that. Watch this. They gave me this control. Very few people give me control of anything mechanical. <laughs> OK, maybe then we know why. <laughs> Don't get too crazy. I got to do it again. <laughs> so we can kill that light. So uh, I'm in. Uh, anybody been to Long Island? OK. 25 A is a famous thoroughfare, and what you learn growing up there is where Washington came here to thank his troops, we thought. And one day, I'm sitting on Northern Boulevard, known as 25 A, and I watched a guy with a guide. It was a, a metal guide, and they were drawing a line in the road. And as they were drawing the line in the road, I couldn't help but ask, I thought a machine did that. I mean, I felt like saying, is this 1910? You know? And he goes, well, this is going to wash away. Uh, we do this. I'm with the Historical Society of Setauket. And this is where Washington came down to thank his spies. So what? He had spy ring? Oh, yeah, he did have spy ring. 
don't worry about it. It was top secret till 1930, without which this ring, we would not have won the Revolutionary War. So I think I might be a victim of uh, hyperbole, but I'm willing to research it. And he said, listen, I know you don't believe me. So he wrote down on a card where to go in the library to take out this book. He said, it's not going to be in a bookstore. Well, luckily, this book wasn't there. It was by Morton Pennypacker. He's the one who put the piece together. Now, you see in the New York Times this little thing, local historian makes major find. He found the last spy, and all the puzzle pieces fit together because we're in the middle of coming out of Depression. World War II is on the edge. It's, you know, where the country was going crazy. You don't really worry about the spy ring from the Revolutionary War. But now it's coming together. So I went and took out this children's book. The, the big book was, was out, and it was written for someone who's a – um, who's almost a, uh, a statistician instead of a writer. Well, the young, child, the young adult book, which is really my mentality and my reading level, <laughs> uh, is 100 pages and told the story. I closed this book. I actually went to the librarian and said, is this true? And she goes, yeah, it's nonfiction. It's young adult, nonfiction. I go, so then I took out the other book, and I knew what I was looking for, and I saw the actual letters written in invisible ink. They were written in between the lines. I saw how a farmer... I saw how a longshoreman, I saw a grocery store owner, I saw how a printer who was really a journalist, I saw how a socialite all combined their energy and learned how to be uh, cutting edge spies in the middle of a war, in the middle of a war with no background. And I went to the CIA because I didn't want to come from an audience like yours or a hostile audience somewhere else and say, excuse me, that never happened. So I went to the CIA, the Historical Society, and that's Historical Division. And to get to the CIA, the one thing that's important is uh, they have to give you a background check. It takes two weeks. And if you're lucky enough to have a car service to bring you there, it turns out you have to clear the driver. Because it turns out um, Muhammad Anton couldn't get past the screener. So to get to the Langley, Virginia, and get to the CIA, I had to walk four miles. I'm soaked <laughs> with sweat because he didn't get past the gate. I get on the inside, and we get in there, and we go through it's like the beginning of Get Smart. All these doors, these doors. And right before I get to the historical area, uh, I see a gift shop. And I'm thinking to myself, don't blame yourself if business is slow. Yeah. I don't know what kind of foot traffic you have in this thing, but I don't think people are going to want the snow globe. All right? So I tell them what I have. They go, I go, can you tell me about the Culver Spy Ring? And they say, tell me what you got. I said, all right. Is this the way it's going to be? So I told him, and he opens up his folder, literally. Opened up a binder. This other guy opened up a binder, and we started comparing notes. And I go, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where you haven't heard. And I went through it. And then I did it like a reporter. I had two years to look at what I was really looking at for 20 years casually. And we put together George Washington's Secret Six, the spy ring that saved the American Revolution. And I think it's representative of this country. We focus on the men on Mount Rushmore. But those men would tell you America is not made up of them. They're on top. But without us, there is no America. So-called average, everyday people doing extraordinary things without getting fame and acclaim perhaps they deserve. Then I said, that went so well, I'm getting out on top. Because I did stand up for a while, and they always told me, if you have a full set, but your third to last joke is getting a huge laugh, maybe an inordinate laugh, leave. <laughs> You're done. So I'm saying to myself, I'll never top this. I looked at it for 20 years. I'm done. So then they said, well, Brian, I noticed you have a passion for the war on terror and bin Laden, and we're hunting for bin Laden at the time. And I go, yeah, I always notice when they want to put this war on terror in context, they always go back to Jefferson. Jefferson was the first one to take on Islamic terrorists. They were called pirates back then, but they used the Quran as an excuse to abuse their people and to be the pirates of the seas. And with us, without a navy in a brand new country, we were ripe for the picking. We just wanted to get out of debt. So our ships would go through the Mediterranean, through four North African countries to sell stuff and trade stuff. And we were, our, our cargo was taken, our crew was, uh, crew was taken as hostage, and the ships were, the ships were kept all ransomed down. First crisis. So what do you do when you have a crisis? You send John Adams and you send Thomas Jefferson. We don't have a president yet. We got two ambassadors, one in France, one in England. So they meet with the Tripoli ambassador, Libya then, uh, Tripoli then, Libya now. And they say, basically, we don't have a problem with you. Your problems with the West, we're brand new. We just want to be able to get our ships through. They charge us an inordinate amount. So they both leave and they're both shaken up, both Adams and Jefferson. So Jefferson says, hey, listen, if we, don't, if, if we don't fight him, uh, if we don't punish the first insult, more uh, insults will follow. He says, I am of the opinion that John Paul Jones and a half dozen frigates would totally destroy their commerce by constantly cruising and cutting them to shreds. Adam's like, by the way, we have no ships. 
He also says, I looked at these guys. We can't fight them unless we want to fight them forever. So I came out and I said, I got to bring this forward. Thomas Jefferson, the Tripoli Pirates. And I was able to highlight people. You pick it up for Thomas Jefferson, but you close it thinking about William Eaton, Stephen Decatur, William Bainbridge, Stephen Decatur's brother, all these great people who lived under the radar that formulated our first Navy, led by Edward Preble, who found a way after making initial mistakes to, to actually suffocate Tripoli until they gave in. And then William Eaton says, I have an idea. Hey, uh, Thomas Jefferson, being that you're doing this war, and you're the president, and Jefferson used to walk around in the parks, and people used to come up to him and complain to him. So William Eaton was a stud. William Eaton was a guy who goes, hey, listen, I was an ambassador over there. I know these people. They're good people, horrible leaders. If you just give me some muskets and a little bit of money, I'll get an army together, and I'll take him. Jefferson's like, can you get this guy away from me? <laughs> well, after two years of not being able to make much progress, and they're not giving in, he goes up to William Eaton. They sit down with the Secretary of Treasury. He goes, how much you need? Here it is. How many muskets you need? Here you go. We never had this conversation. They dropped him in Egypt. He gets a handful of Marines. They put together some mercenaries. They go 500 miles through the desert looking nothing but the stars. No maps to help them. Those maps would be used by Rommel and Patton in World War II. That's how good it was. William Eaton, a self-taught Army guy, marches in and in two and a half hours takes a bullet in the process in his arm. They, they wipe out, uh, they take Derna and hold it en route to take in Benghazi and Tripoli. In Tripoli, they're so freaked out, they immediately call for a truce. In a short time, America's done what no other European country was able to do. We confronted our enemy. We, uh, we honed our skills. We formed a young navy. And together, we were able to bring them to the table. We finally finished them off when Madison came in. And after the War of 1812, and our navy was really up to par, we'd take them for good. And the War of, Tripo and the War of Tripoli uh, was won by us. In fact, there's a couple of quotes. What did William Eaton look like? Eaton is firm in constitution as in resolution, industrious, indefatigable, and determined, and persevering. When in danger, he's in his element and never shows to leave so good advantage as when leading a charge. Has anyone heard of William Eaton? No. Is this an example of great Americans who lived and breathed in their generation, who had a degree of fame, and loved this country more than you could ever know? Does that remind you of yourself? Does it remind you of your neighbor? My goal is to just bring out those other stories. If Jefferson, Jackson, and Washington will bring you in, hopefully you close the book and learn a little bit more. And this one quote by the Pope, just in case you're saying, here's Brian Kilmeade, the Fox guy, talking red, white, and blue without any foundation, Pope Pius VII. And, um, and by the way, the, much better than Pope Pius VI, just by my opinion. <laughs> he says of the Americans. The American commander with a small force in a short space of time has done more for the cause of Christianity than the most powerful nations of Christendom have done for ages. That's your country. You never heard of that, right? So I want to bring out these stories. So if a president's asked in the future, President Ford had no problem answering this question, but President Obama did. He always said, are we an exceptional nation? And he said, yeah, but everybody thinks their country's exceptional. No, nobody has our history. That's why people try to sneak in, and that's why people don't want to leave. I appreciate it. Every day that I get here, I know I feel like you do. I feel like I'm, I made the Pro Bowl. I mean, we hit the lotto by being Americans. I get it. I appreciate it. We just, uh, every once in a while, people forget how good we have it, and people on the outside misinterpret the fights we have and think we're coming apart. That's just the way we do it. We do the things we're not supposed to do. We fight in front of the company, all right? We fight in front of the world. But guess what? It's because we want to be better every single day, and we have different ideas on how to do it. That's what we're meant to do. So after Thomas Jefferson and the Tripoli Pirates, the one war that's always fascinated me, because it was so consequential, but no one cares about it, and no one learns about it, and they don't stop down to talk about it in social studies, in my opinion, is the War of 1812. So I was lucky enough to get a tour of the White House uh, from President Bush, and he brought me to the bowling alley, and I tweeted this out a couple of days ago, and he brought me to the archway, and he said, you know why the burn marks are still there? He goes, well, so that's when the British burned the White House down to the ground. He goes, we're under the, opi we're under the opinion they left the burn marks there to, re to remind us and to remind presidents how fragile democracy is and how close America came to total annihilation. I mean, we have voted in the closest vote ever in the Senate and the House to go to war in 1812. We had a good reason to go to war. The only problem was, wait, it's on the tip of my tongue. We have no standing army. We have a small navy, and we're taking on the world's superpower. That's the only problem. I think the, the vote was very slight. It was 1913 in the Senate, 
79, 49 in the House, we go to war. And we have a great idea. With a small army, let's go to Canada and fight them there. The British are like, really? Is it this easy? Up and down the East Coast, they terrorize, ruthlessly terrorize Americans. We're saying, what they were saying, our American citizens were like, well, how do we, what do we get ourselves into? The British, for the most part, were saying, this is our opportunity for revenge. 29 years later, after the Revolutionary War, the British have another shot at us, and they can't wait to knock us out. And the French are not going to come in and save the day. They just finished off the French and this guy named Napoleon. And by the way, should I mention, they never recognized the Louisiana Purchase. They thought it was done illegally. They've already made a petition to the World Court, and they had one back then to overturn it and invalidate it. So we start this war, Madison's War, it starts with the Warhawks in the House, push them towards this war in many respects. The northeast of the country go, we're not really into it, we didn't vote for it. The British get word, and they leave it alone. They don't really touch Boston, Philadelphia, or New York, because they sense they can get it back, and they're right. They convene a Hartford Convention where they decide, we're going to go up to Madison and say, well, how are we going to secede? Really? You're going to secede. You're going to pull out of the country when we need you most. They sneak into Washington. They thought they were going to get some resistance. Our militia is so unorganized, they burn the White House to the ground. And if it wasn't for this crazy tornado that comes out of nowhere, that puts out the fire and pulls the pushes the British out, they would have destroyed absolutely everything. So let's see. Our five foot three inch president is sitting on a horse by himself. He doesn't know if his wife's around. He knows his house is burning to the ground. The war that he's in doesn't even provide him any army protection, and he watched this militia run for the hills. The food was still warm as the British soldiers got into the White House. They finished off their dinner, and then they finished off the place. If you think things are bad now because Republicans and Democrats are a little tense, forget it. <laughs> because Donald Trump tends to wing a few rallies, I think we're going to be OK, especially you consider where we come from. And overall, it is my belief, if we understand these stories, we're not going to panic on the, the stories that we're in right now. I believe President Ford was in the right place at the right time, and I also believe this militia general named Andrew Jackson was in the right place at the right time. He put his hand up and said, the British, they killed my brothers, they uh, tangentially killed my mother, I'm all alone in the world, I was raised by my town, my county, my country. He lived and breathed red, white, and blue, and a chance to shot at revenge. When the War of 1812 started, he said, excellent, I'm ready, I got a 1,200-man militia. And they said, don't worry about it, Jackson. We got this handled. They didn't. A year and a half in, 1-800-ANDREW-JACKSON. They're calling it. <laughs> so with that, I set the table. And I want you to hear, see what aired on Fox News four days ago. A look at Andrew Jackson, Miracle of New Orleans, with the new afterword, which looks at what other presidents thought about him. And we could hit that play button. Twenty-nine years after defeating the British and winning our independence, America was on the brink of annihilation in the War of 1812. The British were terrorizing the East Coast, had burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. They were heading down south to finish us off. Perilous times. Here at the Hermitage, Major General Andrew Jackson was seething. He had offered his services and his militia to go into battle to fight the British in the War of 1812, but never got the return call. And his country was losing this war badly. Would he get the call? Yes. Would he offer revenge on the British? Absolutely. America needed a leader. They looked to Jackson. Jackson enters the war, and things turn. A series of small victories all led to the final clash in New Orleans. The historic French Quarter. Charters in St. Louis. Why would I bring you to this intersection? Because it was right here in this building, 200 plus years ago, where Andrew Jackson met with his generals and they sketched out a battle plan to take on the British was nothing short of brilliant and yielded unparalleled success. The plan, build a wall, dig a canal, fill it with water, and wait. Wait for the British to charge. The British walked right into the trap and were defeated January 8, 1815, in under 45 minutes. If you lost New Orleans, and if the British controlled the great city, you lose the entire Mississippi River and you lose all of our western frontier that we acquired through the purchase, so we wouldn't have been able to do westward expansion. The War of 1812 allowed Jackson to earn a new title, War Hero, catapulting him to the presidency for two terms. The boy, orphaned by 13, ended up as one of the most powerful men in American history, but he was also one of the most controversial. 
nobody doubts that Andrew Jackson was an impactful president, but now his legacy is being re-examined today. Why? Because of the people that lived in quarters like that. Those are slave quarters. And at one point, Jackson had over 100 slaves working the Hermitage property. And he had many famous battles with American Indians, as well as playing a role in the Indian Removal Act. With all those things aside, it hasn't stopped 14 presidents, some of the best we've ever had, from coming to this place to find out what made Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson. Lincoln saw how Jackson kept our country together after South Carolina tried to secede during his administration. Teddy Roosevelt wrote a book on Jackson and studied his leadership principles. In Harry Truman, Andrew Jackson had perhaps his greatest admirer. Harry Truman, for example, kept a figurine on his desk of Jackson. That's correct, and, and actually came here to measure Jackson's clothes so that the statues he commissioned for Kansas City and uh, Independence were proportioned to Jackson. And then Ronald Reagan came here to wait a second to salute the founder of the Democratic Party. Yep, Ronald Reagan came here to speak. He spoke very vehemently about Jackson and the ideals of Jackson that needed to be brought back into the country in the, in the 1980s. And when Donald Trump came here, he was the third president to lay a wreath down on Jackson's tomb. Andrew Jackson was a military hero and genius and a beloved president. Andrew Jackson. The Battle of New Orleans made him famous. The way he led made him iconic. The way he lived made him infamous. And most agree for America, indispensable. So there you go. That's Andrew Jackson, the miracle of New Orleans. Now think about one area that I find pretty amazing. Number one, I've just successfully done everything I was supposed to do. I can keep the curtain closed. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for me. Thank you. So, you talk about the miracle of New Orleans. I didn't just throw that out there. The Ursuline nuns uh, were, were there since 1726. When we had the Louisiana Purchase, Jefferson goes to check out New Orleans. The nuns need to meet with him. They said, we're going to be okay. He says, as long as America controls New Orleans, you're going to be okay. When Jackson wants to win over the town, he doesn't know what he's going to find when he gets there. He needs a lot of recruits. He's got a 1,200-man army. He's got to quickly get up to 5,000. He goes to see the nuns. He said, are we going to be okay? He goes, absolutely, I'm going to fight for you. He goes, then we're going to pray for you. And the other half of our convent is going to be a hospital. Okay, sounds great. The Ursuline nuns back them. They, I just visited them, did a fundraiser with them last weekend. They celebrate January 8th, 1815, every single January 8th. And they know when Jackson came back 25 years later, he didn't go to the battlefield. He went to see the nuns. So they believed there was something special. The guy who led his army to victory believed there was something special. And that leads me to believe that our country has got something special. We're not perfect, but we try to be. We don't, we don't always make the right decisions, but ultimately we end up going the right direction. Militarily, we finally picked the right general. Think about this. The British had to land in the perfect spot. This guy Cochran, uh, Cockburn landed in the wrong area. If Packingham, who was late getting over here, he, was, he had Wellington's Invincibles, the team that, the, uh, the army that just beat uh, Napoleon. Wellington goes, I don't promise myself much success here, but I'll send my brother-in-law. <laughs> and Packingham's the brother-in-law. So he's late getting over because they killed Admiral Ross in the Battle of Baltimore. So they go, Packingham, go over there and lead these guys. So he's late getting over. Cockburn does a stupid thing. He lands at the wrong place. One thing Jackson did is give in and hire these pirates who pitched their services to him. They were pretty much scoundrels and mobsters. But he goes, we got guns and I got people. And Jackson said, shake. <laughs> so they're in. And he goes, listen, if they land there, we know how to stop them. And they landed. And he said, they will not have one restful night on our shores. And as soon as night breaks, word gets out that they're here. Jackson's army attacks ruthlessly. Uh, Captain Gleig on the British side was quoted as saying, it's the most brutal fighting he's ever witnessed. We attack with axes and hatchets. So the British can't figure it out. In the pitch black, we're attacking them ruthlessly, relentlessly, and could have almost finished off what was the beginning of their army. Are these the same guys that turned and ran in, uh, in Washington? Yeah, we got better along the way. I found quotes of people, of American citizens saying, whatever happened to the spirit of 76? It was only 1812, and they're already ready about, worried about losing the spirit that formed the country. So that's another storyline we need to understand. If you're worried that we don't understand this country, they were worried 20 years after we founded the country that we weren't going to realize what we had. So they land at the perfect spot. And when they finally disembark, their ships are too big to get close. But ours are flat. 
and we start lobbing cannonballs day and night. Packingham lands. He finally chases our ships away. He looks around. He goes, whose idea was this? We're packing up and we're leaving. Cockburn says, hey, if you don't have the guts to fight, you can leave. We're staying. I'm taking New Orleans. I'm going to be running this place. I'm going to be in charge. Packingham goes, all right, I'll figure this out. Big mistake. He also made a big mistake by waiting. And while, while he waited, Jackson was recruiting, he was drilling, and the whole town was digging. Digging the ditch, filling it with water, making it a burn. And then they built another one and another. They were going to fight him every step of the way. And he said, by the way, for those of you who hope we lose, I'm burning New Orleans down before the British get it. I'll fight him right up to Mississippi. That's determination. That's determination when you've lost every significant battle, and the Treaty of Ghent is being hashed out by a bunch of people who have absolutely no power. John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay are over in Ghent trying to figure out a way to get out of this war with a little bit of dignity. And you know what the goal of the British was? They were pretending to negotiate. But the goal of the British was real simple. Lord Castlebrough said, the British Foreign Secretary put it over the, uh, once the large seaport towns of America were put into ashes and New Orleans captured, the British had command. All the uh, rivers of the Mississippi Valley and the lakes would be in control. The Americans would be prisoners in their own nation. Oh, really? Those are the people we think are, are negotiating a peace treaty with us when they weren't. So they taught us in school that you didn't have to fight the Battle of New Orleans because the Treaty of Ghent was signed. Uh, Ron Drez, who's an elite historian, decorated Marine, who helped me so much with this book, found the paperwork five years ago that revealed that they were told, uh, that uh, Packingham was told, if you hear word of a peace treaty being signed, ignore it. Power through and hold New Orleans. Anybody who studies the British know they like to get it and they like to hold it. Look at India, look at Hong Kong. We would have had them controlling the Mississippi for 100 years. You control the mouth, you control the river. How significant was this victory? Unbelievably significant. How unfathomable was it? Unbelievably, the odds were against us like you would not believe. They had 9,000 guys, we had 5,000 guys. They had war experience, we had none. We put together an army of 1,200, made it 5,000 three and a half weeks with free men of color, Cajuns, pirates, uh, uh, Choctaw Indians, Cherokee Indians, regular militia, Kentuckians, and Tennesseans, who seem to always show up for wars for America. They oftentimes are the most patriotic, and the other thing is, they don't miss. Because they did this thing called uh, not going to the supermarket for eating. They actually would have to shoot their dinner, and sometimes their lunch. There was no spam back then. So they were great, they were lethal. In 45 minutes, we take them out. Look at these numbers. Killed, America lost 13, they lost 290. Missing, we lost 30, we were missing 39, they were missing 1262. No, excuse me, those were casualties, 1262, we had 39 wounds. Missing 19, they had 484. The general thought about the military historians is that when they were blown to pieces. We immediately killed three of their generals, seven colonels, 75 officers. When they want to surrender, Lambert gets up and says, I'd like to surrender, we're lost, our guys are all dead, we need some help with the wounded. Jackson kept sending him back. He goes, send me your senior officer. He came back to Jackson and says, I'm it. He killed the others. <laughs> when this is all done, it is the second biggest holiday in America, January 8th, 1815. And even though the treaty was signed, America sent the message. We could take on the finest for fighting force in the world twice in 30 years and beat them both times. We would never be invaded again. The word went out, you're not going to cut off the first democracy in the world or the only democracy in the world. It's going to spread. And all your finest citizens that are coming to America, they're going to have a place to go. We're not going anywhere. It gave America a sense of pride that was undefinable. And here's, for those 25 years later, the last quote I'll read you is, this is what Andrew Jackson said for the critics that he had him back then that said you didn't have to fight this war. He said, if General Packingham and his 10,000 matchless veterans could have annihilated my little army, he would have captured New Orleans, sentried all the contiguous territories. Through a technicality, the war was over. Great Britain would have immediately abrogated the Treaty of Ghent and would have ignored Jefferson's transactions with Napoleon. They already had paperwork in to overturn the Louisiana Purchase. So they told us in school it didn't matter, and I think you read this book and you'll find out it did. In terms of the man, Jefferson and Jackson had a little bit of a rivalry. Here's what Jefferson said. The defense of New Orleans should teach the nations of Europe, while Americans intended to take no part in their wars, neither would the country shrink from self-defense. And in Jackson's farewell, I think it's worth sharing. I thank God for my life has been spent in a land of liberty, that he has given me a heart to love my country, 
with the affection of a son and a son to his country and a father to his people. On his last day, Stephen Douglas, same Stephen Douglas, said this when they went to dedicate a statue to Jackson in Washington that still stands years after his death. When Jackson had died, there was a sense of completion, that the race has been finished. He felt that his work was done, his, his mission fulfilled, and there was for a moment unanimous tribute. All felt that a great man had fallen, yet there was consolation in the consciousness that the luster of his name, the fame of his great deeds, and the result of his patriotic services will be preserved through all time, a rich inheritance to the devotees of freedom. And that's the way it's been until recently. They defiled his grave. They're trying to stop the Jefferson Jackson dinner for Democrats to celebrate themselves. They are trying to take a statue down in New Orleans, although I do not believe they'll be successful. President Obama's trying to take them off the 20. President Trump's not going to let that happen. 50% of the country, when Donald Trump says he reminds me of me, and he's right in many counts, we could take questions on that. 50% of the country said, okay, now I definitely don't like him. And 50% said, oh, now I really like him. So that divided more. What I tried to do is outline a perk. Biden wasn't perfect, but man, was he important. And I also have to line this, that I think it's extremely bad for us to evaluate people in history by 2018 values, because we're going to get evaluated the same way. I just think it's inaccurate and it's arrogant. I think you appreciate, you study, you look. No one could ever, ever rationalize slavery. Some of the things with American Indians made no sense. Some did back then. They, you know, the original fight uh, maybe was started by us, but a lot of those wars in between, uh, the battles that he fought were justified. So you could debate that. That's what we used to do in this country. We used to debate things, not vilify people for wanting to debate things. So my hope would be afterward, and I'll open up to questions, was this. I just want to take me out of it, take Trump out of it. I want to tell you what other presidents said. If FDR shows up at the Hermitage days before World War II because he wanted to walk in, even with his polio, into that house and channel Jackson, his quote was, the more I study Jackson, the more I love Andrew Jackson. Teddy Roosevelt had problems with Jackson but said this, there was one military genius in the War of 1812, it was Jackson. Lincoln thought so much of him, he studied him before uh, the Civil War, doing everything he can to avoid it, and took excerpts of Jackson's words for his second inaugural. Ronald Reagan, you know how, how special that was? He insisted on taking his picture for uh, Parade Magazine in front of that Jackson statue in front of the White House. That's a Republican doing it to a Democrat. And Harry Truman said it reminded him of his dad, everything about Jackson, Truman loved and worshiped. He went to the Hermitage multiple times to see what Jackson would do. And if those special men could look at Jackson as a special guy, Republicans or Democrats, I think it's worthy of our time, and I don't think we should put him on the Ashburn history. When he passed away, and even up to 50 years ago, he was listed as one of the top presidents we ever had. He actually gave us the last surplus we ever had in our budget, balanced the budget, and had a rainy day fund. Now, annually, we have a $700 billion deficit, $22 trillion overall. How bad could he have been? So that's Andrew Jackson, Miracle of New Orleans. That's my speech looking back. I'll also take questions about would you perhaps have written down, or if you want to jot some down, some questions about uh, other things going on in the news. Somebody told me that midterms are coming up. I had not <laughs> heard that. I'm trying to get a second source. But thank you very much. And, I'll, I'll, and I'm signing all your books right after this, too. So Don, you want to take some questions? Yeah, is the uh, mic working? Everybody here? Uh, you have your three by five cards. If you can, uh, if you have questions and pass them to the side, uh, we will do our best to get to them. But understand, Brian also will be signing books uh, out in the lobby, so you'll have an opportunity to ask him if I overlooked your question. While we're gathering up some more, Kristen and others off to the side. I've got a couple uh, for you already. Uh, one uh, person asked, "Did you get good grades in history in school, and what sparked your interest?" in American history? Uh, I, ju I just took to it. I just could not believe that I could walk on Long Island, the Revolutionary War, where people would say, well, this is where this battle took place, that where this battle took place. If I was in a different place, um, you know, obviously people in Virginia got everything. But if I was maybe in a place that didn't have the American history, I wouldn't have been as interested. I like history, but I love American history. I did do very well in political science and history and social studies. I couldn't get enough of it. I had a few teachers that did some things that really stood out. He made us name all the presidents. Uh, when we got into it uh, every single time. And I remember 
Uh, Jimmy Carter was the one he had to cut out of Time Magazine. That was eighth grade because he just replaced Gerald Ford uh, on the wall. I also had a teacher that would explain things like, all right, you want to know what trench warfare is? Separate all your, uh, all your desks in a row, and you got to get two pa papers in each hand. I need you to climb over, over the desk and under the desk, over the desk and under the desk. And when you keep in mind, when you go up, you're exposed. You got to get down quick. And then that, I always knew the rest of my life, that's World War I trench warfare. So I just had these great teachers, uh, and I had the unbelievable political science teachers in college, and I just took to it. But I think anyone would take to it, because if someone says, I'm not interested in history, I just say, do you like stories? They go, yeah. Do you like stories about stuff you like your country? Well, yeah. Do you like stories that really happened? Yeah. You like history. <laughs> How could you not like it? Put, puts in perspective what we're going through. And if you could walk up and see a sign that's this spy ring is now outlined. We took some of the proceeds. We helped outline the whole spy ring path. So you see where they went. And I see the farm where they used to bury the notes and cylinders. And I say to myself, man, I'd love to go through there to uh, go through there. But I think the owners split it up into eight properties. And I think most of them have guns. <laughs> so they would shoot me. Do we have other questions? Um, any on the cards? I could hear you if you want to put your hand up. It's pretty clear. Well, who collected them? Can you see the group rebuttal? We can have so many more. Um, when you guest host on the five, who do you have the most fun with? Um, everybody except Greg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's got emotional and mental issues. It's really sad <laughs> uh, to see this play out on live television with our ratings. And it's, uh, it's a train wreck, and I feel bad for him. Uh, the five has never been better. I don't think that's ever, uh, the ratings are through the roof. Uh, by the way, on a side note, if uh, the country's broken up 50-50, why do all the ratings with Fox? And my humble opinion, having seen it, is because you don't really have to switch the channel to get an opinion. Now think about this, on the couch with the under, with outnumbered, you got somebody with a different opinion, it's gonna rotate. You have some Juan Williams or who's ever subbing for Ron, uh, Juan Williams, Marie Harp, on a regular basis, you have to rotate. Chef Smith and Dana Perino's show, uh, very different from Neil Cavuto's show, and very different from Hannity. At night, it's Hannity, Laura, very different shows, but similar points of view. But I just think that the thing that they found out at Fox is, if we could stop people from switching the channels, where to get another opinion, you might stick around, and the numbers reveal that. And I think this Fox Nation thing, you, I think it's worth the five bucks. At least uh, for the last year, I've been shooting different history pieces that I think you're really gonna love, and they last like 25, 45 minutes. And we always try to have an angle you don't know. I was able to go to Mount Rushmore and sit on George Washington's head and stare down at Lincoln's nose. Uh, Francis Tavern, where George Washington said goodbye to his troops, and then left and went on a barge and went back to Mount Vernon. And you can actually see the same place that he was in. You can, he, he describes walking out and seeing the water, and there it was. You could see where the barge was. Um, we re, we uh, rewalked the Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton, um, and we didn't sing it all. Uh, <laughs> that whole thing, right, New York City. We went to Jefferson Island in the middle of the Keys, which was a prison island where the, one of the conspirators that killed uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Dr. Mudd was, and then ended up being a fort. It's pretty amazing. So you know, that's some of the things we do, and that's some of the things uh, about Fox that I think made you guys like. Question on Andrew Jackson in a book that's chock full of interesting characters. If you set aside Andrew Jackson, which character fascinates you the most? Well, his wife and the dedication. Here's the thing. You would tell me about uh, Betty Ford and Gerald Ford. They've been through a lot, but they were extremely tight. You hear about uh, Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan, inseparable. You talk about a relationship that works. Uh, their relationship was unbelievable. Every day that he was at the Hermitage, he would go out in the backyard, and their tomb would be in the backyard, which is a little weird. But he'd go out and have uh, breakfast or coffee with his wife in the back. Uh, and she was described so interesting. They were kind of brutal back then. They were short and round. Uh, <laughs> he was tall and thin. He was 6'1", 140 pounds. 
and all, they went out of their way to describe her as not shapely, and <laughs> they, they couldn't be more different than each other, and yet he couldn't be more protective of her, their couple, their relationship. I thought it was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, I think that relationship really stands out. A lot of the British, you mentioned those British officers that came out to make their name and finish them off. A lot of them ended up dead and humiliated. I mean, Packingham comes to get out of Wellington's shadow. You think he's going to be in control of Louisiana. He's, he leaves in a barrel. And there's so many things, that there's so many characters that stand out. One person asks, the only other book I've read on the War of 1812 was By Don's Early Life. This is a Francis Scott Key question. Uh, can you comment on that part of the campaign? And, and that's the other point. That I was going to do the Battle of Baltimore because I was going to do the Battle of Baltimore because uh, we were having this big controversy with the national anthem, and I wanted to get to the bottom of it. And I think that Francis Scott Key was just trying to get a friend of his off this ship, and Francis Scott Key was against the war until they burned Washington. By the way, wrong thing to do. We found out the Alamo too later on. They try to intimidate us by doing things that are even unethical in war and attempt to get Americans madder. And at the Alamo, it was supposed to be so devastating, we quit. Not good. We doubled down and won. And then you burn Washington to the ground. We never burn, you know, there's a reason why there was a, there was a, there was certain conduct when it came to war back then. And it's like, you don't burn the capital. They burned the capital. So Francis Scott Key was trying to get his buddy off a ship. He takes a ship out there, takes a boat out there, and these ships, can't get any closer to Fort McHenry because we knew uh, how far their cannonballs would go and we sunk all these ships in the Baltimore Harbor. So we knew how big those ships were. They couldn't get any further. So when those cannonballs were bursting in the air and the flag was still there, there was a reason because they were kept from getting any closer. So this was the, this was the battle that turned the British back for the first time. So Francis Scott Key was told, okay, uh, buddy, uh, this battle has started. You're not going anywhere until tomorrow. You might as well watch. So he's sitting there on a, on a ship trying to get his buddy off the boat, having a normal conversation as a journalist and a writer and a, a, a poet. And he's looking out there and he's saying, man, if we lose this, we lose the country. And he wakes up, the smoke clears, the flag is still there, bombs were bursting in the air. And not only that, we kill Admiral Ross. And Ross was the one who was supposed to lead the charge into New Orleans. They had to get Packingham in. So it was Francis Scott Key who was able to record this, publish it, and later they made it into a song. So to me, people are like, I don't, it glorifies war. No, it signifies the saving of a country. So that's why I thought the Battle of Baltimore might be cool. And I was told, oh, Battle of New Orleans didn't really matter. It was a devastating win. And then I got educated on that. So I, I, I thought it was, it's a fascinating tale. There's a lot to be done there. You go to Fort McHenry, this is what's great about our country. We got guys and women reenacting every day. So Monday at 2 o'clock, what are you doing? I know what they're doing. They're sitting there walking whatever tourists go to Fort McHenry through playing a character in a period of that time, whether it's cleaning guns or a soldier. These people are amazing. That's how much they love the country. They love telling the next generation stories about past generations that they didn't see, that they studied and learned. And, you know, I could see if you were an aspiring actor looking for a big break. These people all have other jobs. Yeah, the same thing with the spy ring. These guys are telling me everything they know. And I'm like, you don't mind that I'm going to write a book on this? And I, I felt like saying, you know, you go, no, we, we want you to tell the story. My, my whole thing was, too, with the spy ring was verifying the verbal stories, the oral stories. I'm like, this is fascinating. How do you know? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know if it matters. So I, I need to go source this out. So I had to go source it out and back it up. So some of these were exaggerated. Some of them weren't. But it's these people that do this thing on a daily basis that keep America's story alive. And Don, you do a lot of that every day. Oh, yeah. I get paid to do it. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Isn't that great? You get paid? You didn't tell me that. <laughs> I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> well, I talk to my bosses about that. Uh, let's let this stand as the last. Uh, uh, oh, no. Maybe this will stand as the last one. Um, Unless it's too personal. <laughs> or if it makes me cry, that'll be a problem. Um, uh, th um, this person is a Vietnam uh, American filmmaker. Uh, you and all the people work on Fox News inspire me. Most uh, of my friends uh, uh, convinced me Fox is a racist channel, and they uh, uh, divorced me well. or uh, for for not believing them. 
Um, may you give me advice on how to talk, uh, or how to make their mind uh, change with, um, without a loss of friendship? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the big thing in this country right now. If you don't, uh, if you don't agree with somebody, you stop talking to them. And it's not rare. It's families. It's neighbors. They don't want to hear it. So that's part of the reason why, on a side note, nobody has any idea what's happening in the midterms. Because if you're a Trump supporter, you're not telling anybody because you don't need to hear the backlash. And you're not really interested in getting the feedback because you already made your own opinion. So that's why the polls were so confusing in 2016 and probably going to be confusing again. Uh, in terms of this, we that word is thrown around so much, racist, sexist, homophobic. I don't even know what they mean anymore. I mean, the threshold is just off the charts. Um, if you Google um, anybody on Fox, 97% of it's negative, but, um, and 96.5% is wrong. You know? <laughs> so all I can say is we're guilty of one thing, being maybe too pro-American. We don't get up every day thinking about what this country does wrong, and that was a big change. That's why we're so different. We don't get up every day talking about all the negative things about the country. I mean, can we pretend as if we're not in the best country in the world? It's hard. But we don't go out of our way to, uh, to look for problems with America. Uh, we look for things that are right. And there's nobody, I've never run in the green room uh, on the set with someone who struck me as racist or sexist. But there's been, a prob there's been problems at Fox. There's just like a problem at CBS, problem at ABC, problems in, uh, at Wall Street, problems almost every industry uh, with what's going on uh, in terms of society. But in terms of our programming and things, uh, feel comfortable defending Fox. I've been there for 20 years. Uh, there is no, uh, there's no dissemination of color, race, or anything. We just have to tell a, a story in a way in which uh, perhaps um, it relates more to the people in Grand Rapids than it does in New York, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles. So we feel more comfortable here. Uh, not in the just the Ford Museum, but in the Midwest and in the South. That's the way we skew. Uh, and it seems as though the other networks didn't even know you guys existed. So uh, we, uh, we, we started in the middle and worked our way out. Um, they stay on the coast and don't have any interest in going in the middle. So and that's it. And I just think, you know, I th I'm very proud to work there. I would never work in a sexist, racist place. And when you served in Vietnam, you never got the respect you deserved by serving in Vietnam. Uh, we try to do that on a, on a regular basis. And I think people appreciate us in the military and in law enforcement especially. Because now all of a sudden we have to defend uh, the men and women who are walking the street for very little money uh, trying to keep us safe. Whether it's giving direction or going, going in the middle of a domestic dispute, suddenly they're under attack. And that's the next big thing. And if you talk to people in law enforcement, they tend to appreciate us. So, all right. Brian, I want to thank you for coming out, uh, for taking part in this show. I want to thank you and your marvelous staff, your publisher, for helping make this possible, uh, this evening possible. Um, thanks to my museum colleagues uh, also for all of the work they did and to the Ver Gerald R. Ford Foundation uh, for helping make this possible as well. Thank you for coming out. Um, yeah. uh, very much appreciate that. Um, a token of our esteem, we wanted to present you with a Gerald Ford desk set. All right, um, thank you. Pen and ink set. I appreciate uh, it. And he has books out there in the museum store. He will be out in just a moment to, uh, uh, to sign those and to meet you and to answer those questions that you didn't get answered or didn't and we ask do, you. And we can do pictures, too. And I can personalize them uh, for the holidays. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want. We'll be out there in just a minute. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out. We're going to go in this end.